between AO and uh, CCOT. Um, so we have, um, uh, we are really lucky to have four uh, very experienced uh, speakers um, and uh, I'd like to have a few minutes uh, in order to um, introduce all of them. So first of all, in the order um, uh, that we have seen before, uh, there's uh, uh, James Waddell. Uh, he is the only Secretary General um, um, among this group. Uh, he is the Secretary General of uh, CICOT and one of the representatives. Um, he uh, is Canadian. He uh, graduated from the uh, University of Alberta Medical School, uh, then completed his uh, training in Toronto which is where his uh, subsequent career has uh, been going on. And uh, he uh, over there achieved uh, almost everything that you can achieve. He's a staff surgeon at St. Michael's. Uh, he is uh, chief of orthopedics, chief of surgery, and head of the trauma program. And uh, then he um, moved on even further, and he became uh, uh, the clinical lead for orthopedic surgery in the province of Ontario. Um, and so he has a lot of experience about how to set up uh, a program uh, like that. Christoph Sommer is the next speaker. He is probably one of the most uh, famous uh, AO representatives. Um, he has been uh, a chief of trauma at the Kur University, uh, a Kur uh, hospital where um, the famous publication uh, about uh, pylon fractures from uh, Thomas Rudy and uh, Algor was uh, uh, developed, and so he overlooks a lot of acute injuries, not only in geriatric but also in younger patients. Um, he, sure enough, uh, has been a past president of uh, the Swiss AO, um, and he is currently an honorary member, which he became last year. And he has uh, a tremendous experience in being a member of the AO Technical Committee uh, since 2006. Um, I've seen him uh, speak about uh, the development of periarticular, uh, periprosthetic uh, plates, and I was, uh, I have to say, that I was extremely, um, extremely impressed. And the implant that he is going to uh, show us today, he also has uh, has been um, a, a developer of that as well. So then, Peter Bates. Peter Bates, is, uh, I've known him for a long, a long time either, uh, also, and um, he works in London. Um, he is a consultant at the Royal London Hospital, um, and he's the uh, senior uh, lecturer and co-chair for the orthopedic trauma uh, surgeon. He's also a co-founder for OrthoHub, and um, he had uh, undergone some interesting training in several places, such as Dallas, Texas, Nottingham, uh, UK, where he worked with Chris Moran um, and Christchurch, New Zealand with uh, Andy Vincent. And he, of note, uh, he has also been involved in the implant development of a proximal femoral nail. And then, of course, uh, from London as well, Dr. Uh, Xavier Griffin. He is the chair of the Trauma and Orthopedic Research Group at the Blizzard Institute at the Queen Mary University of London. Um, and he is uh, uh, there uh, a, an honorary c consultant as well. Um, so I'm not sure among the two of you if the Queen has a hip fracture, who is going to do that, but maybe you can tell us. So after this uh, introduction, um, I'm really pleased that uh, we can start now with the first uh, conversation. And I'd like to uh, my, uh, just uh, mention that my co-moderator, Vikas Kanduya, uh, he is uh, one of the rep representatives of CICOT as well. He will uh, finish the session, and uh, in between we will uh, share uh, our experience. So, let's go. So, I think it's my, uh, my time now for my presentation. So, as you heard, my name is Christoph Sommer. I'm from CUR, and... Uh, I will give you a talk about um, the femoral neck fractures, fixation, and more or less in younger patients. So, uh, 
you see that the topic of my talk, fixation thermal neck fractures using a new implant, tips and tricks. And I will concentrate mainly on two things. Here you see my disclosures. So as we already heard in this nice introduction by Christoph Pappe, I'm a member of the AOTK and was involved in development of this implant I will show you later on. So the two topics I will go through is one reduction and the other one is fixation of femoral neck fractures. Uh, reduction, uh, in my opinion, it's mostly done closed and I will show you why I think so. Um, if not possible, of course, we have to do an open reduction. What do we know from the literature about the reduction, so open versus closed? Uh, there is uh, one systematic uh, review done and published in 2015 showing that uh, in uh, the conclusion of, of this review was that they did not really find a significant difference in the incidence of non-union vascular necrosis and all other complications. However, they were able to show a higher rate of deep wound infection with open reduction. So uh, a later publication, uh, which was in the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma two years or three years ago now, uh, we saw Dutch, uh, such pictures showing open reduction in uh, young femoral neck fractures. And uh, they showed also such pictures of uh, intraoperative fluoroscopy with, uh, let's say, you see the approaches, you see the different uh, reduction tools they used to, to and uh, Finally, they showed such pictures as there is a combination of a sliding uh, dynamic main implant with some small plates, which are, of course, not sliding. So it's, it's, uh, for me, it's a little bit confusing. And especially in the summary, they wrote that in most fracture patterns, an open reduction is preferred. That's not really my experience, uh, and uh, I will tell you or show you why. So here, just six examples of a displaced femoral neck fracture, as you can see in younger patients. And you see here the intraoperative fluoroscopic views and all after closed reduction on the traction table. And these are perfect reductions. Now, what do we know about the closed reduction? So we know since many years, uh, different publications, and this one showed and, and summarized all the different closed reduction techniques, as you can see here. I will not go through all these, of course. Uh, I will just tell you uh, how we do it usually. So that's a typical uh, displaced femoral neck fracture in a 53-year-old man. So it's more or less a young patient. Uh, typical varus and anterior angulation or dorsal tilt of the, the head fragment. So what do we have to do? I mean, it's quite clear. We have to pull. So we have to uh, pull uh, there and give some traction. And on the other hand, we have to do some uh, internal rotation. Sorry for this animation is not working perfectly, but you see here, so traction and internal rotation usually gives us a nice reduction. Uh, when we do this internal rotation, this will change the shape of the proximal femur in, in the fluoroscopic AP fuse. So the, the change will be that the lesser tuberosity, of course, disappears because we have this internal rotation. So I think that's the typical aspect after we, we pulled and did, did uh, internal rotation. Mostly it's a little bit in distraction, and I think it's important to release the distraction so to bring it a bit closer that we are not fixing this fracture in distraction, which is not really good. Now you see such a picture here. This was the same fracture. Now reduction closely on traction table, perfect reduction both planes. What most of these fractures, at least in our uh, experience, have is some sort of posterior inferior comminution. So it's not really a comminution, but you see in most cases some small pieces there. So it's not just a two-part fracture. Mostly there are some pieces out. And here is uh, the situation after fixation. You see here the post-operative picture, six weeks, three months, and one year uh, nice healing. Now, how do we do that, uh, this uh, traction internal rotation? 
I show you here on this picture, and if you look to the traction table, you look to this leg on the left side, you realize that this is a maximal internal rotation. And uh, I think that's very important. I think the internal rotation really has to be um, very strong, of course, not <laughs> breaking or damaging the knee joint or so. But I usually do the internal rotation as much as you can see here that the patella is internally uh, rotated and usually in this position the femoral neck is horizontally in, in, in our room. And then uh, if we have that, this position, it makes it much easier to do the instrumentation than with the fixation. Now, if you use now the X-ray beam vertically, we have this typical experience, uh, as, uh, aspect of the proximal femur, so the lesser tuberosity is disappeared here. And then I know I have, let's say, a perpendicular view on this femoral neck. And if the X-ray beam is vertical, then I know my, my working plane is horizontal in the room. And this makes it quite easy. If then we go with the fluoroscopy 90 degrees around, so 90 degrees, and we have a true axial view of the proximal femur, then it's proof that we have, let's say, our neck in a horizontal plane. And then it's, as I said, it's easy to, to do the instrumentation. Just another six examples. So these examples are from the last three or four years in our hospital. And you see again here, close reduction of the traction table, uh, nice uh, reduction alignment, especially in the axial view, which is very important. Now, if this is not possible, and I will not tell that this is always possible, but very rarely it's not really possible, as you can see here in this young patient, uh, which was uh, in a wrong angulation, especially in the lateral few, maybe was there a bone piece impacted. Though usually we start with some mini anterolateral uh, mini incision and come in, let's say with a shank pin, for instance, in the head fragment. Uh, here we use the Hohmann retractor uh, to bring this around and then we had uh, more or less an anatomic reduction. You see here the post-op picture and the healing after six weeks. Here's another example. It might be that we insert through a small incision a hook, as you can see here, uh, and uh, help for the reduction and also here a good healing. Now, second uh, point I want to bring to you is this uh, fixation using an FNS, thermal neck system, and especially how can we limit the dynamization, which might be a problem that I'll show you. Now, the FNS is an implant we developed uh, some years ago. Uh, as you can see here, it is uh, launched uh, to, uh, 2017, and uh, many of these implants have been worldwide used. Uh, it exists out of four pieces. So we have the so-called plate. We have a bolt. There is an anti-rotation screw, which is connected to the bolt. And then there is one locking head screw distally, so four pieces. And uh, here you see two pictures, uh, or let's say this one picture, uh, just ex uh, explaining a little bit again the, this implant. So it's easy handling because uh, it's minimal invasive. Uh, there is an aiming chick, so it's possible to insert it through a small incision. We have a small surgical footprint lateral on the femur, nothing protruding out there, uh, even if uh, we have dynamization. We have a centric position of the neck screw or the neck bolt uh, and an anti-rotation screw. And this fits well even in small uh, femoral necks as in the Asian population. There is a stable connection between the bolt and the anti-rotational screw, both together are one unit and they slide in this plate. Uh, as I said, it fits to a narrow neck and uh, there is a controlled impaction. So we have a maximal impaction of 20 millimeters if this is fully out, but I will show you that this might be uh, intentionally limited to, to a lesser distance. And also important is there is no insertional torque. So it's not something like a screw we have to screw in or a tapper we have to tap. So no uh, torsion 
onto the neck, uh, onto the head fragment uh, doing the instrumentation. Now here you see the two pictures and uh, I show you the difference. So uh, if you look to that, it looks very similar, but if you look closely, we see that on the left picture, there, if you measure this distance, it's 20 millimeters. On the right picture, is 7 millimeters. So this means on the left side, there is still a full impaction of 20 millimeters possible compared to the right side, where only 7 millimeters impaction or uh, uh, compaction is, is possible. Uh, so why should we limit dynamization? That's an uh, important question. I just demonstrate you that on this case. So it's a thermal neck fracture. Uh, nice reduction, I think everybody agrees, even on the calcar side, it looks that there is a direct contact. Uh, but what happens post-op and after one year? So if you compare now the situation or, or look to the opposite side after one year, we can measure how we want to. It's a fact that this femoral neck is shortened 15 millimeters and consequently the, the leg is shortened 10 millimeters. So the function still is okay. I know this because this is a colleague of myself who lives just uh, in, the, in the office uh, beside me. Uh, he has a good function, but it is not really what we like to, to have. So what happens here in this situation? If you analyze the po intro, post-op, and so the pictures and see and look when did really this, this uh, shortening occur, we see that this happens usually in the first six weeks. So some uh, happens between po intra-op and post-op, and then in the first six weeks. So we thought about, can we limit this dynamization? Yes, we can, and uh, I think we should do that in uh, special cases. Here you see another example of a 58-year-old male with some uh, these pieces. As I told you, this uh, some sort of comminution. Uh, also here, nice reduction. You see the pieces there. Then after instrumentation, uh, we intentionally uh, limit this uh, dynamization to 7 millimeters, as you can see here. Now what happens from intro to post-op? Uh, millimeters left and after six or seven weeks it was down to zero so this means at that time it stopped so we had a, a, com uh, a compression or dynamization of seven seven millimeters and not 20 millimeters and the healing occurred uh, very nice as you can see here after three and a half months so how can we Limit this dynamization, I'll just show you quickly that. So we insert the, the central guide wire, we measure the length, we measure here, let's say 90, 95 millimeters. So we are not choosing 95 FMS, we choose a longer one, 105. We insert it down to the stop, as you can see here. Uh, and then the plate stays off the lateral cortex. And then we can uh, uh, turn on this wheel, so adapt the plate to the femoral uh, shaft, to the cortex there. So here it's still five millimeters off, so we have to turn again. And then as soon as the plate is touching the, the bone, we can insert our locking screw. This means we have uh, this already dynamized, then anti-rotational screw, of course, is inserted, and that's the post-op. Uh, picture, intraoperative picture, so we see five millimeters left. So we don't really know how much we should limit that, so it will be a question of, of getting more and more experience, maybe you have to do some biomechanical testing, but I think that's that's an option we, we, we have, but we do not really know uh, the perfect answer. So take home messages of my talk is uh, I showed you that at least in our hospital and with our patients, we can, in 95%, we can get a nice and anatomic reduction closely. And using this uh, new implant, it is possible to limit the dynamization. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Chris, that was fantastic. We've got a few questions coming up. So before the next speaker, if we could kindly take them, that'll be great. 
the first one is how much degree of um, malreduction do you accept when you're reducing your fractures closed? Uh, Does it have I to be yeah. perfect? Does it have to be perfect or um, you have a bit of uh, 5 degrees or 10 degrees? What, what do you yeah. accept? So I would say in the AP view, I uh, look for, if possible, some slight valgization, but not too much. But if some valgization, that's okay. But in the axial view, I do not accept much. Of course, if it's not possible, maybe I, I accept 10, uh, maximum 20 degrees. But usually I try to improve it. I see some cases in our hospital done by also surgeons that they are not perfectly reduced. So we get some experience with this uh, malreduction. And interestingly, they usually they heal in this malalignment. So it's not so that they don't heal. But I think it's not perfect for the, for the function later on. Sure. And is there, do you have an indication for open reduction straight away where you would not even try closed reduction? Do you have any specific indications for open reduction? You said only yeah, 5%. I, yeah, I, I think I would always try to do it closed, but if there is really, let's say, a garden 4 fracture where you see a high-energy uh, fracture young patient, where you see a full disconnection between the distal and uh, fragment of the head, that you see on the x-ray that the capsule is ruptured, and so then I think there might be an indication to uh, directly uh, open approach. But this is a really an exceptional case. Brilliant. And there's another question about, uh, is there a need to remove the implant? And have you seen any subtrochantric fractures due to new trauma because of this implant? Because of a stress rise uh, there? Yeah. Uh, I personally saw none in our hospital. We know that some... Uh, iatrogenic or peri-implant fractures have occurred. It's always difficult to say if there was an additional uh, second trauma, yes or no. Of course, this can happen, as in any implant uh, there, but the risk is very low. Uh, and in all the biomechanical testing we, we did on cadavers, we didn't see uh, a fracture at that level. Implant removal, uh, yes, I think in younger patients, maybe we should remove that. Uh, we had some problems, uh, especially at the beginning, uh, when we removed some with the locking head screw, which was uh, locked too much, so we had to drill off the head. Uh, but all the other cases we removed these implants, they came out uh, smoothly. And of course, if you have to uh, convert it to a total hip, uh, it has to come out, that's right. Chris, there are lots of questions coming in. We'll probably take them towards the end. I'll, I'll stop here and I'll introduce our next speaker, Pete Bates from Royal London. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, Pete, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Brilliant. Uh, Chris, that was that was an awesome talk. Thanks very much. Uh, it's, uh, some beautiful reductions there. Uh, uh, so this is a slightly oblique. My name is Peter Bates. I'm uh, an orthopedic trauma surgeon, at Bart's Bone and Joint with Xavier, and um, I'm talking about neck shaft fractures, which is slightly divergent from the overall like uh, topic of this this webinar, which is more and more on the fragility line. Obviously, neck fr shaft fractures are are more um, uh, more high energy. Uh, those are my disclosures. Uh, and that's my talk. I'm just going to sort of like whiz round, whiz round in a, in a circle like that. But just before I do, I just wanted to just give you a little flavour of the evidence base out there that I, I, looking at that I did uh, in, in preparation of this talk. The evidence around neck shaft fractures is predominantly retrospective case studies, you know, 25 here, 16 there. Uh, the highest goes up to about like 100 or so. But, the, you know, they're retrospective case studies uh, and, and associated review articles. Um, there are some consistent themes, so there, there's, there's useful stuff in there, but interestingly, regarding treatment of them, there's virtually no consensus whatsoever. Um, so here we go, talk about fracture types, let's start there. Um, and I think with neck shaft, it's really helpful if you separate the two fractures, think of them as two totally different things. How would I treat that? How would I treat that? And that's going to be a theme going through my talk. So I've separated them up here, but just before we do that, what's the epidemiology on this? How rare are these these injuries um 
because it goes back to this, this study from Arlo, uh, which was in 1997. He did a big meta-analysis of all the, the uh, case reports up until that time. And he declared that 1% to 9% of all femur fractures also had a femoral neck fracture. And people have been quoting that ever since, right up until this year. Another article, again, quoted 9% as the... As the I mean, but we all know that that's not true. We all treat femoral shaft fractures regularly in our day-to-day practice. And it is not... T- nearly 10% of them that come back with uh, with uh, femoral necks. Marin's interestingly did, did a, uh, published a study of 1,400, it's like an observational study over 10 years. They looked at all their femur fractures and they only found uh, 1,400 femur fractures. They only found 16, 0.1% that also had a femoral neck fracture. So my feeling is that bottom one is much, much closer to the overall epidemiology of this than the top one, which everyone seems to quote over and over again. The femoral neck, let's uh, start there. So what, what, what do you know about the femoral neck? It's often undisplaced. There's a kooky thing about these fractures. Uh, usually, you know, undisplaced femoral neck fractures when isolated is really unusual. But in the uh, neck shaft scenario, it's high. It's up there around 30%. In fact, that, that same author, Arlo, um, they reported 30% of missed fractures. So those were like 30% of fractures, which weren't undisplaced, they were missed because they were so undisplaced. So it's probably 30% plus that are completely undisplaced. Uh, you know, often, so often this is the kind of picture where on the edge of the, edge of the radiograph, you can see like a undisplaced femoral neck. Um, and, you know, a lot of those early studies publish, th- you know, images like this, where you've got like someone's nailed a femur. It looks like they've done a good job and the CT looks awesome. Uh, but uh, po- post-op, they're complaining of pain and you get a, a repeat CT and you see this. So that is something that, that definitely does happen. Here's another example. Normal looking CT. Uh, this was back in the days where they um, uh, where uh, uh, fixes for t- damage control X fixes for femur fractures were quite in vogue. Uh, but you can see that there's a, there's a, there's an intracapsular fracture up there. Um, but there's a, obviously an upside to this of this of, of being undisplaced uh, because. Uh, if it's undisplaced, then you can go ahead and fix it easily with very, very little morbidity. So there is a lot to be said for, uh, you know, I mean, so, so there is an upside to this is that is that, you know, that makes the fractures some very, very much easier to deal with because you're going to end up with an anatomic reduction. The other thing about the femoral neck is they are mainly intra or pericapsular injuries. So you see like only like 40% or so are, or a third or so are, are per or intertroke. The majority are basi cervical, intracapsular, rotationally unstable, quite difficult to manage. Um, as, as you can see here, so you've got a very really simple shaft, but quite a tricky femoral neck. Uh, and not only are they basically cervical intracapsular, they're also vertically oriented. They also have a much higher rate of, um, of high Powell's angle uh, fractures. So they are tricky when they're displaced commonly. Um, so overall, the um, what I would say about the femoral neck is that they are often undisplaced, which is great. And that makes life easy. But when they're not undisplaced, when they're one of these guys, they're often tricky and difficult. And that's why sometimes using one implant to fix the whole fracture, particularly in the, in the face of a displaced femoral neck, can be awkward because it's a less forgiving implant. Uh, what about the femoral shaft? Not much to say here other than uh, they're often high energy and comminuted, exactly as you would expect. Uh, so there's a much higher rate of, of comminuted femoral fractures uh, on the shaft. So overall, the neck is often undisplaced, but when it's not, it's often an awkward configuration. I think that is the take home message here. Um, uh, as far as the shaft is confused, often, often comminuted in high energy. These tend to be comminuted injuries, uh, high energy injuries. Diagnosis, what do we know about that? Well, I reported you about, about uh, 30% of missed fractures, but obviously that was a meta-analysis looking back across the 80s and 90s, maybe a bit in the 70s as well. So that was, you know, before CTs were, were commonplace, before we were doing, uh, you know, like... Uh, you know, uh, they weren't done for all femur fractures, and there wasn't the, the quality of the scans wasn't quite so good. But as time has gone on, that's got better and better. And so the most recent one, just recently published in EJOST, uh, reported a less than six percent rate of missed fractures from the femoral neck. So, but look at that; it's still less than it's still a, still a number, isn't it? It's not zero; it's six percent. So uh, obviously. Um, uh, you know, if you, we just carry on as we are with our great CTs and everything else, we will still miss some fractures. So my take home message here is that, yes, you do need 
a CT-based protocol for sure. Uh, but even so, even with the best radiologist, the best CT, you will still miss some fractures. In the same way, a CT doesn't always pick up undisplaced femoral necks, you know, in, in an isolated setting. Sometimes you need an MRI to to to, to um to uh, pick it up, but obviously you're not going to be doing MRIs in these patients because they're usually associated with polytrauma. So, um, if you're nailing a femur, any femur, and you're nailing it, check the neck at the beginning, at the end, particularly at the end. Give it a little rotation side to side once you've taken your traction off, uh, 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 just to make sure that you have not got um, a, a femoral neck fracture that you've missed. All right. Complications. What are the complications? Well, uh, you can get complications associated with either of these uh, injuries. Obviously, the, comp the commonest complication of the shaft is non-union, and the commonest complication of the femoral neck is either AVN or cutout, as you see here. Uh, how how frequent are they? Which is the more complicated? Which is the more common? Well, femoral neck is about six percent. Femoral neck failure is probably about the same. It's still it's single figures. Uh, although no one's really, but uh, it's quite difficult to pin down a number from the uh, from the figures. But weirdly, the, comp the, the complication that is most common by far is femoral shaft non-union. When you take out the infections, femoral shaft non-union is by far the commonest problem. Um, so get the neck right. That would be my take home message here. Um, if you get the neck right, I would say. AVN or femoral, I mean, AVN may still happen, but femoral neck non-union or femoral neck or femoral head cutout, which is the downside of, of, of not getting your implants in the right place, is unlikely, is rare. So focusing, prioritizing on the femoral neck is, is a good thing to do. Um, but shaft non-union is the thing that's going to bring him back for surgery most of the time after these injuries. Um, implant choice. So this is like just as a, a whiz around of like how to fix these fractures. Um, and the killer question that everyone asks is one implant or two. As you can see over here on the, on the, on the far right of your screen, that's your cephalomedullary nail, the one implant solution. Uh, next one in the middle is an anti-grade nail with femoral neck fixation. And then you can have a retrograde nail with femoral neck fixation. And that could be a DHS, it could be screws, it could be a FNS, it could be whatever you like. Um, and the literature is very clear on this. There is no consensus. There is no no one of those has shown superiority in terms of uh, femoral non-union, femoral neck cutout, AVN, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All right. So uh, it doesn't matter which whichever one sits happier with you is is the better thing to go for. If you think about the shaft fractures, what do we want there? Well, length, rotation, and alignment. That's, that trips off the tongue very easily, doesn't it? Oh yeah, length, rotation, alignment. Blah, blah, blah. But that is what you want. It really is. That is what you want when you're fixing the, the distal femur. Put it another way. If the femur does go on to a non-union, if you've fit, got the length right and it's not de it's rotated correctly and the alignment is in good alignment, then, all, then treating a non-union in that setting is very, very easy, very straightforward. Uh, you know, a, a, a exchange nail or some, some interference screws or whatever it, it requires. But the management of a non-union when you've got those things right is much, much easier than if you haven't got those things right. Um, maybe my exchange nail might be needed down the line or, or some kind of intervention. Um, and you can see here is an example published in one of the papers I reviewed. Uh, you know, they started off with a neck shaft that got a one implant solution. Looks like they did a really nice job. And sure enough, the femoral neck healed up beautifully, but the femoral shaft required a bit more in order to get it over the hill. And so they've done a, a exchange nail and it's got profuse callus. So that's kind of a story that you often see uh, in these injuries. Um, go easy on the traction for the, for the femoral shaft. So you put on traction, that's fine, but go easy um, because uh, you know you don't want to displace your femoral neck uh, in the process of trying to reduce your femoral shaft. And I think if you do have a femoral neck that's minimally displaced or, or you, know, you don't want to displace further, then use of a, um, a femoral distractor is really, really compelling because it, um, it, it drags it out. Uh, I stole these images off uh, Ian McFadden. I'm grateful for those if he's watching. Uh, but, you know, that, that drags your femur out really nicely. Uh, and, uh, and then you can do your nailing without uh, having to put excessive force through the femoral, head, femoral neck. Uh, for the proximal fractures, if it's undisplaced, if a proximal fracture is undisplaced, I would definitely go for that first. And that could be either with a with a, a medullary nail, if that's your choice, or DHS, FNS, 
uh, cantilever screws, whatever it is that you're, you're doing there. So I think that's one thing that I would definitely say is, 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 is you know, to be recommended because then you can deal with the femoral shaft second. If the proximal fracture is, is displaced, that's when the, that's when it becomes a bit gnarly and tricky because you've either got to say, well, do I try and reduce this femoral neck in the presence of a floppy shaft? That can be quite difficult. But you'd be also worried about displacing it further when you're doing your femoral nailing. So uh, my solution to that would be, if it's displaced, I would generally put a wire or something, get a, get a coarse reduction of the femoral neck and put a wire up it to give it some, some stability, excepting it's not perfectly reduced. Then I would nail my femur, and then I would come back to the femoral neck and go, right, okay, now I've got an isolated femoral neck and I can do the very best I can do. Uh, but for both fractures, particularly in the proximal, the usual rules apply. And you know all of those. Uh, uh, Chris has given a beautiful demonstration of how to fix femoral necks, and I'm not going to try and reproduce that. Tip apex distance, uh, reducing fractures, really nice. That hook, I love that hook, Chris, behind the lesser trot, uh, under the, the, the medial neck. It was a beautiful description of how to get on top of a Powell's type, uh, a, a, a vertical shear uh, Powell's type 3. If for pertrochanteric or subtrochanteric fractures, getting your entry point nice and nice and medial, almost medial to the great trochanter, so it's not having a lateral entry point, so you avoid varus in your fixation. Um, and of course, this is something we haven't really touched on, but it'll be interesting to hear what everyone has to say on this. But I, I always say for young patients with femoral necks, don't weight bear them in the same way as you would an elderly person, because actually they've got to, they've got to, you know, they, they've got to tolerate that shortened femoral neck for the rest of their life. So uh, weight bearing aggressively on a on a on a on a, a neck fracture in a young patient is probably something I would avoid. I tend to keep the toe touch weight bearing for, for a good eight weeks. Um, don't agonize over stress rises. So you've got your, your femoral nail coming up and your fixation at the top. I used to spend a lot of time fasting over, uh, you know, getting the DHS screws straight through the nail. Hey, you know, high fives at the end of the case. So that, that is fun. But actually, it doesn't seem to make a huge difference. And I think stress rises are much, much less relevant in young patients and you do get remodeling in that interfer interference zone over time so i, I think I, I i worry about this less uh are there any bad options well on the left you can see this one down here don't, you know don't fix the femoral neck poorly if you get your tip apex distance right and do all the things that chris just showed you you know that the, they the, the top end of these fractures ama does amazingly well I don't think plating femur fractures is, is, is something we, that's seen very commonly in modern practice. So I, I think that's just a bit of an old school x-ray you're seeing over there on the right. Um, so for implant choice, do what you're most proficient at. Do the thing that makes sense to you. But uh, two implants are often easier than one if the femoral neck is displaced. One implant is, is inherently less forgiving. So if you're going to do a cephalomedullary nail, it's probably you know you, you've got to be confident that's that's gonna that's gonna work for you, uh, and if if your femoral neck's undisplaced, you might want to put a wire up the femoral neck before you put your nail down so that you don't displace it and you know uh, make your life more complicated. All right, two quick cases to finish. Uh, first one's very very fast. Forty seven year old female. She fell from the first story. So it was a high energy fall, but I think this has more of a fragility pattern because it's a it's a relatively simple femur transverse, not particularly com not not comminuted, and it's a slightly harder femoral neck. You know, sub uh, you know, sub capital, bit awkward. Uh, you know, the reduction is not going to look perfect. Uh, unless Chris does it, um, and uh, there you go. So, so what would be my my strategy for that? Well, I'm thinking that's a simple femur. I would probably go after that first, and just put a retrograde nail up, very nice and easy. Uh, uh, and I, 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 but I would probably put a wire up the neck first to stabilise that retrograde nail. Then I'm I'm in charge of the femur, and I can put traction on, do all the things that Chris said to get the neck absolutely perfect. And that's what they did in this case. I think the reduction is reasonable. Uh, you'll see there's a fully threaded screw, posterolat a posterior inferior, exactly where uh, Chris was showing the, the, the comminution, and those are the uh, and, and they're, they're nicely spread out, good 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 spread on the screws. Uh, it's it probably doesn't have the same as an FNS in terms of overall stability, but and we'll see how that goes. The patient may yet get AVN, so we don't know what the outcome of that's going to be. But um, uh, that's how I approach that one. Last one, and then I'm done, is a 32-year-old male. This is high energy. So he's, he's, he's fallen off a balcony, like much, much higher, fell onto a railing. And um, you can see he's open at the distal femur. Uh, not a huge gash, but it uh, doesn't need plastic surgery, but it's open. And 
the weird thing is I'm called by one of my colleagues. I'm not on call. One of my colleagues calls me while I'm, I'm, I'm on holiday. And um, what should I do with this, Pete? I'll send you the images. What do I do with this? And it's interesting uh, answering that question when it's not you doing the surgery. It's somebody else, somebody who's not that used to doing this kind of stuff. And how do you advise them? And he was saying, uh, well, wh what I want to do is I want to, I'm obviously going to debride the wound and then I'm going to do a damage control plate for the, for the, for the shaft. I'll do a damage control plate. Just get a plate on because it's open anyway. And then I'll do a neck DHS once I've got control of it. And that, I have to say, seemed like a very sensible approach to this. So I said, yeah, okay, well, let, let's do that. And we could always revise the fixation, the damage control plate later down the line. The thing about damage control internal fixation is that sometimes if the patient gets a bit sick, have a bad chest, a bit of a head injury, other things going on, the, the, the damage control can become definitive. And that's kind of what happened here. So these are the things. And you could tell straight away that this was a struggle. This, this was a difficult operation. They really struggled with it. The DHS actually went in second. I put them in the wrong order. But you can see it's an okay reduction, but it's not great. I mean, Chris would not, I'm sure he's turning in his, uh, curling his toes in his shoes there. Uh, and you can see that it looks okay on, on first glance, but this was a struggle. You see how the plates are now overlapping and clashing. So uh, there would have been some compromise in the position they went. And the post-op x-rays, now look at those. And I'll ask you, which of those injuries, the femoral neck or the shaft, which is going to be the problem down the line? And I'm sure you're all looking at that shaft going, uh-oh, that ain't going to heal. And sure enough, if I fast forward you to the, you know, to the nine month, uh, like nine to 12 month mark, that's where we are. The femoral neck has not been touched. That DHS is the same one that went in before. Uh, but the femoral, the femoral sh shaft is still short by a couple of, by two or three centimeters. Uh, the rotation's right, but the, you know, it's, it's still not fully united. And this guy's got a lot of recon yet to go. So, okay, let's back up the truck. What would I have done differently? What would I have done differently faced with that? Well, I think it, my, what my learning from this was if, if a colleague brings you up and they're not really comfortable doing this quite tricky operation, I would just say, wash out the wound, close it up, put him on traction, and um, someone who is more you know, like used to this kind of stuff can do it on Monday, in the same way as I would do for a difficult proximal humerus, which I'm not happy treating. Um, if it was me doing this, I would, I would definitely go for, um, I would go for, I wouldn't go damage control, I would go for a retrograde nail, and I'd put that up, and I would, and then I would lock it up, uh, and then I would, and then I would do a DHS at the top, um, uh, and I would use a lot of those um, uh, reduction techniques that Chris showed earlier on, like the hook on the the, the medial neck, uh, and just whatever whatever it needs in order to get it perfectly reduced. I, I agree with you. I generally do not do open reductions of um, uh, and this is in, intracapsular, but intracapsular fractures. All right, so that's my talk. Um, just in summary, you do need a protocol to diagnose uh, to diagnose uh, uh, femoral neck injuries. Uh, the femoral neck is often awkward, difficult. For, if it's not undisplaced, it's often awkward. Um, femoral shaft is the most common late problem. I do nonetheless prioritize the proximal fracture, you know, mentally. But equally, at the same time, I'm separating two fractures. What does this one need? What does this one need? Treat them on their merits. And, and rather than trying to go, let's treat them all as one great big thing. The usual rules apply for the shaft and the neck. So all the things you know about for treating those injuries, they still apply in this situation. Uh, two implants may be easier than one, certainly is in my practice, but I, the, 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 the um, literature does not reflect that in terms of outcomes. Uh, and don't stress over stress rises. Thank you. Oh, fantastic, Steve. Uh, I'm delighted that this question has come up. Uh, and the first question is, uh, how do you actually blend your presentation with your video? So give us a tour of that. <laughs> it's cool. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's Prezi video. Brilliant. Prezi. Okay. So... In, in in short, it's Prezi video. Okay, uh, back short to subject. Prezi video, and and any it's not it's not it's not a Mac thing. Anyone can do it. It's it's uh you can you can you can just stick your powerpoints in it. It's it's easy peasy. It, it it's it looks terribly flash, but it really isn't. But it took cool. it took some convincing of the AO guys to allow us to do it because they were like, oh god, but I need a copy of your presentation. <laughs> okay, we we we'll, we'll stop there and come back to the subject matter. Uh, two, two, uh, questions. two questions. 
What do you do in an older patient if they've got a femoral neck fracture and you've got to do a hemiarthroplasty along with a femoral shaft fracture? How do you handle that that's one? A that's a cool question. question. I love it. I love it. And, and you've, yeah, that's a great question. I did actually have an example of that, which I, I just didn't have time to include. We had, I had an example in a 90 year old. And you've, you've just got, again, separate the two. What does this need? What does this need? If this needs a total hip replacement or a hemi, that's what it gets. And then you've got to work out a way of now arranging your femur fixation around that hemi. Almost think like, okay, now I'm in periprosthetic mode. Uh, now what does my femur fixation look like? And then you would reverse that. So I would probably put a lateral plate on, a long lateral plate. I would fix it distal to where my stem's coming down. So the, the, when, the, when the hemi goes in, it overlaps my plate, but doesn't hit the screws. And then once it's all in and I'm happy, I can then fill up the top screws around the, uh, the shaft of the plate. Cool. Next question is, uh, how often do you land up opening the fracture side for reduction in these neck shaft fractures? This is the femoral shaft you're talking I, about. I would say virtually never. Virtually never. Okay. But I, I mean, never ever say never because exactly as Chris showed, if you've got a 22 year old and you just cannot get the thing reduced, then that's totally fine. Uh, you've, you've got you've got to do what you've got to do. But I, I, I absolutely agree with his uh, uh, his his summary of like, you know, 94 percent or it's pretty closer than 90, 98 percent for me of, of oh. closed reductions. Closed reductions. And the final one is uh, from Joe. Do you worry about the stress riser fracture between the cannulated screws and the retrograde intramedullary nail for proximal femur and the mid shaft? Yeah, That's and I, 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 I think I addressed that. You know, I, I think I went that. I, I, I don't is the answer. Okay, if it's a really elderly patient, then yes, absolutely. If it's a fragility situation, yes. If it's a young patient, no. Young high energy, because they one they, they, final they... one coming in. Yeah, go ahead, Pete. No, no, it's fine, it's fine. Okay, one final one. What's the ideal for a basic cervical fracture uh, neck of femur along with this? A hemiarthroplasty, an early mobilization, or internal fixation in an elderly patient? Oh, in an elderly patient? Um, yeah. Uh, I, I, think, I think for neck shaft in an elderly patient, you want something that is, uh, I, I would go entirely internal fixation. The only time I would really do a hemi or, or a joint replacement is if you've got like a, a head that is you really think is not viable. So that's a garden, two, a garden three or four. Uh, subcapital fracture. But I think for a basi cervical, I would still consider that extra capsular, and I would go with a DHS. Uh, in, in my practice, I go with a DHS and a um, and a nail. But if it was undisplaced, I would probably go for a Keflame medullary nail and do it all in one. One. Okay. Brilliant, Pete. That was fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. And we go on to our next speaker, and we continue with uh, Prezi as well, a professor. Xavier, Thanks, go for it. Yes. Okay, great. Well, it's it's fantastic to be here with you all um, from East London. I'm here with Pete, uh, and I'm going to roll on a slightly different version of Prezi. So you're getting the whole Prezi experience today, as well as hearing about how to uh, look after some fractures. So I'm uh, going to kick off in my conflicts. So I'm a consultant for Johnson & Johnson and for Stryker, and I'm a receipt of multiple uh, research council and industry uh, research grants. All of the receipts come to the university for teaching and education. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? Well, I'm talking about the role of total hip replacement in hip fracture, and I'm really looking at the uh, fragility hip fracture end of the spectrum here. So we're moving a little bit away from what Pete was talking about. And I'm going to try and do a deep dive into what is a pretty congested pool of evidence. And um, there's a lot of data out there around hip fracture care which is fantastic, but it can be difficult to peel apart what the, uh, what the evidence tells us to do in our practice. So what I want to get to is a point where we can take away what I think the current best evidence uh, would support for our clinical practice. And I think of this a little bit like peeling apart an onion. We're going to start with a very top level overview uh, and we're going to deep down, peel away the levels uh, to get more granular data. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to look at a series of different types of systematic reviews. First of all, a network review, um, and then pairwise systematic review, and they have come out on, and are coming out just at the moment with the Bone Joint and Muscle Trauma Cochrane Review Group, which I would uh, advocate to you all to get onto the Cochrane Library. These are free to access publications, and they summarize 
all of what I'm going to talk about today. And then the elephant in the room, the very large trial, which many of you be aware of from the international collaboration called the Health Trial. So first of all, I want to talk a little bit about network meta-analysis. Wow, what's a network meta-analysis? Well, uh, a network meta-analysis is a way of synthesizing all of the available data that we have around different treatments for any one particular condition. And here's the summary uh, plot, which really lays out for us uh, the information that's available in the network that we performed for intracapsular fractures. So if you zone in now on that diagram, you can see it's made up of a bunch of blue circles. Each one of those blue circles represents a treatment option for which we have some randomized controlled trial data. The size of the circle tells you how many patients received that treatment across all of the different uh, trials that we included. And they're connected together with a bunch of lines. And the line means that there is a trial that exists between those two treatments. And that's a direct head-to-head -head comparison within the trial. The thickness of the line tells you how many trials are there. So skinny lines, one or two trials, big fat lines, really common trial, uh, lots of trials out there. And the area that I want to focus into are the two blue circles labeled G and L. G is down at the bottom there. That is uh, total hip replacements. And L is the really big one off at about 3 o'clock on the network. Uh, lots of patients, lots of trials comparing to cemented modern unipolar hemiarthroplasty. So what's the Sander, clever thing about... Sorry, I well, to interrupt you. Uh, we don't yep. see your video feed anymore. Can you please activate it again? Oh, wow. What's that? How's that? We back? We back. No, nope, we're not back uh, yet. Keep no, there's nothing to see. So maybe, maybe uh, if it doesn't work, now we can we're just, back. Uh, <laughs> continue with the next. How's that? You should see a nice picture of the network plot. Yes, we, we can, can see you just fine. Great, fantastic. So apologies for that. I'm not sure. We must have dropped out on the Wi-Fi. Um, so the clever thing about the network is it allows us to combine not only direct comparisons that exist where there are trials between total hip replacement and cemented hemiarthroplasties, but it also allows us to use all the indirect comparisons by taking uh, routes around the network which exist between other trials which might compare internal fixation, nails, other types of arthroplasties. And the computer model synthesizes all the data, both the direct and indirect data, and gives us a really fantastic summary. And when we performed this, we included 119 trials, and those trials uh, looked at lots of different types of comparisons, and we were interested in three outcomes. So we did three different plots, one for unplanned return to theatre, one for mortality, and one for health-related quality of life. And what we found is on the outside of the onion, on this high-level view, really no evidence that total hip replacement gives you a different outcome compared with a cemented modern unipolar in any of those outcomes. And that's really important because um, that might fly in the face of some of the other types of evidence that we have out there from observational studies. But I would caution you that network meta-analyses depend upon an enormous number of assumptions that we can't really go into now. But it's really the totality of the evidence synthesized together. And I think it's helpful to set the context when we burrow in a little bit deeper. So the next layer of the onion really is a pairwise comparison, looking for trials that are specifically comparing total hip replacement with probably the alternative in most people's hands of a uh, arthroplasty. And we did a separate systematic review and here we had 58 different trials available, so shrunken down from the 119 which included other treatments. And 17 of those were specifically looking at total hips versus hemiarthroplasty. We had lots of other trials looking at slightly different comparisons. And we were interested in what were the differences in terms of activities of daily living, functional status, quality of life, mobility, mortality, delirium, and unplanned return to theatre. And you can say, why, why pick that list? Where did you get that from? It might sound sensible, but what was the reason for that? Well, the reason is, is that we did a core outcome set. What's a core outcome set? It's a group of outcome measures which are specified by patients and by methodologists. And what they do 
is they come up with a bunch of outcomes which are most relevant to patients that we can measure appropriately inside the trials so that when we judge what is better, we're judging it in a way that patients and clinicians value. Now, what I want to tell you is that uh, we performed this review and you can see here what we have is a forest plot of just one of the outcomes, which is functional score. And the functional score is showing us um, the difference in how well the hip works. It's not showing us quality of life or any other metrics. And those of you not familiar with forest plots, down the left-hand side, you can see the studies that are included. And down the right-hand side, you can see a vertical line, which is the line of no difference. And each one of the plots is represent, or each one of the data items from the trial is represented by a green splodge. The bigger the green splodge, the more data and the bigger the weight for that trial. And the confidence intervals are the horizontal lines. The little diamond at the bottom represents the summary from the mental analysis. And what you can see is for function, there's a very small but statistically relevant benefit that favors hemi uh, sorry, favors total hip arthroplasty. And I'll show you this particular uh, slide because this is the only one where we find a difference. For all the other six measures, there's really no difference. Um, and so any any of our conclusions uh, that we might draw is balancing up which one of these outcomes is most relevant, what's the relative benefits of each of them. And, and ultimately, only one of the seven is giving us any signal that total hip replacement might be better. And so our overall conclusion was that any benefit is marginal um, and probably is only in one or two domains uh, that patients value. So we're peeling back the onion skin and we're saying, okay, what do we do next? Where do we go now? Well, we're going to go into really granular data by looking at probably the standout trial, which informs most of the data in these two reviews, and that's the health trial. And it included approximately 1,500 patients uh, across the world. It's a really fabulous study. Um, now, I want you just to bear in mind a couple of points about this study before we take it into how we interpret it for our practice. Very few patients were excluded because surgeons felt they really uh, have a hemiarthroplasty. So the more frail end will all tended to be included. Down at the fitter end of the patient groups, 6% of all the patients that were screened, which was many thousand, and I'll show you shortly, uh, they were excluded because the surgeon felt they really must have a total hip replacement and they weren't in equipoise. And that has to be carried forwards into how you interpret this for your practice. And the patients were largely ambulators, or they're all ambulators, nearly all of them cognitively intact. And only 50 or so out of the 1,500 were institutional, uh, lived in institutional environments. And they looked at all-cause revision procedures, function using the WOMAC scale, and then health-related quality of life. And you can see here that we've got this lovely um, consort flow diagram. Uh, difficult to read the numbers, but I can tell you that uh, several thousand were screened, of which 1,500 were recruited. And they were nicely randomized with excellent follow-up through to 24 months. So what did they find? Where's the detail? Okay, so the primary outcome measure you may remember was all-cause revision surgery. And here's a plot. It's a Kaplan-Meier plot. Many of you will be familiar with that. On the vertical axis, you've got the proportion that remain unrevised. So 100% top of the axis there is good. And then time across the bottom uh, going out to about uh, two years or so. Uh, essentially, the statistics says that there's no difference between the groups. But if you zoom in, which is what the inset in the graph shows you, if you zoom into uh, the detail of the early part of the graph, you can see that the hemiarthroplasties have fewer secondary procedures than the total hip arthroplasties in the early phase. And that pretty much approaches a uh, uh, consistent revision risk by the time you get out to about one year. What about the other outcome measures? Well, uh, functional uh, benefit, there was a marginal statistical significant difference, similar to what we found in the uh, systematic review that I showed you earlier on. But the effect was very small and much less smaller than the clinically relevant size. And so the investigators themselves suggested that it probably wasn't clinically important benefit. And for health-related quality of life, there was a very, very small difference in EQ5D, the measure we're familiar with in Europe, but the more commonly used measure of the same thing, uh, SF12 in the States, 
showed no benefit. So I think what we can say is that the health trial really shows that there may be a very tiny benefit in some measures of function, but we are setting that against a substantially increased uh, risk of revision in the first year at the very least uh, for total hip arthroplasty. So how do we take that away? Well, I think that the way to interpret all of these data taken together for our clinical practice is there's a group of patients for whom you're dead set in your mind who need a total hip replacement. Maybe the cyclist that comes off their bicycle at 60 um, who then breaks their hip and you decide to do a total hip. You should keep on doing total hip replacements for those very, very fit intracapsular fractures. But if in your mind you're a bit 50-50 as to whether the patient is going to benefit from a total hip over hemiarthroplasty, you probably should do a hemiarthroplasty based upon the fact that the risk profile is increased and the chances of a benefit in terms of functional quality of life is really very small if it exists at all. Um, I've covered a lot of detail and I just want to uh, signpost you all to a place where you can find alerts to the Cochrane Library as it gets updated. These reviews, I've given you a sneak preview. None of that is actually published, but it'll be out in the next few days or weeks. And if you uh, follow us on Twitter or you follow us on Instagram, you can follow these QR codes and we'll flag as soon as these publications come out. They've all been peer reviewed and they're just in the final publication tweaks. Okay, Vikas, I'm going to let you come back in now. And uh, and have you got any questions from the floor for us? From the floor, to Crystal Clear. I've got a couple, if that's okay. Uh, what about dislocation rates? Seems to be the main uh, in total hip femoral neck fractures. What uh, what's your view on that? And what's your view from the evidence point of view? And also from the health trial? Are these early failures? taking back to theater secondary procedures dislocation yeah great question so um, the health trial where the data is <laughs> and you're able to see very clearly what the causes were um, you can see there that the all-cause secondary uh, procedures is pretty similar over a year or two years but when you burrow into the causes of the revision procedure you'll see that technical uh, issues regarding uh, dislocation particularly are much more common in the total hip arthroplasty group. That large difference tends to be cancelled out by accumulation of other events which you think might well be equally distributed in both arms and the, and the key thing there being infection, right? So the total hip replacement and hemiarthroplasty group in this group of patients have quite a profound infection risk very different from the overall risk that we see in OA if you're doing a hip replacement for osteoarthritis. And the dislocation risk signal tends to be lost when you start factoring in those other causes of revision surgery. May I interrupt because we cannot hear you because there's some problem. We cannot hear you at all. It was uh, rather low before, now we cannot hear you at all. Checking. Maybe... Uh, I, mean, I, I can just about hear you, Vikas, but you're very, very quiet. Can you hear me now? Okay, yeah, it's perfect. Much Excellent. Brilliant. Okay, second question, Xavier, is uh, I'm sure you face the same in your own hospital. There's a level one trauma center uh, you decide to follow the NICE guidelines. You you want to be able to offer total hip replacement to the patients who really need it. But how do you manage a rotor in terms of the hip surgeons who can who can offer that operation to the patients? Um, 700 to 800 knots coming in. Yeah, brilliant question. So for those of you who might not be familiar, in, in the UK we're operating under uh, two systems of recommendations, one being the, the National Institute, so NICE, and uh, they're recommending 36 hours to get your hip fracture surgery done from the time of presentation. And we also uh, run under a system of payment called best practice tariff, which is a pay for performance structure that incentivizes early surgery. So Vikas, I'm totally live to your question about do we have an intervention that we want to roll out in 36 hours? 
What are the options to make that work? Does everybody do a total hip replacement, even if they're not doing it as part of their practice? Uh, well, I can tell you in the UK, my experience of talking to other hip surgeons is that's not the case. People feel uncomfortable offering uh, total hip replacement for hip fracture outside of another part of their practice involving hip arthroplasty. Um, we actually looked into this in, a, in, uh, in some observational data we got from what's called the white cohort. And we looked at the reasons for delay for surgery. And people will say, based on observational data, that delay to surgery causes excess mortality. And that's true if you look at all causes of delay. Um, but when you unpick what the cause for the delay is, if the cause is an administrative cause, most commonly because you're waiting for an appropriately trained surgeon to carry out best surgery first time round, those patients actually have better baseline quality of life which is not surprising for people for total hip replacements, and they end up doing better and their mortality is lower. If you have to delay because there's a medical reason for your delay, the patient's very sick, they start off much uh, iller and they do much worse and they have excess mortality. And so I think what we're saying is that when you look at everything combined, just like the infections outweighing the dislocation problems, when you look at a big uh, accumulated score of any delay leads to excess mortality. That's true. When you peel apart more granular data, delay for administrative reasons doesn't confer excess mortality. And so I would always say that to people that the evidence recommends get the right surgeon to do it in daylight hours with the right skill set. Um, and if that means that your road to the patient waits more than 36 hours, then I think that's okay albeit there's a humanitarian component to this. You wouldn't want a structure in your hospital where the patient waited many days because that's a very painful, unpleasant environment to be in. Cool. Uh, I have a quick question on the, I have a quick question on, uh, on the, the management that you do. Um, and um, so I guess you have some kind of uh, orthogeriatric co-management or fracture fr fragility fracture network. And uh, can you give us a frank impression of uh, how uh, it has changed everything? Yeah, well, I think um, so. So in that same study where I looked at uh, with, with, with others, I looked at the delay to surgery. We also looked at the different components of the uh, performance indicators, the performance metrics that predict outcome. So we have seven different uh, performance indicators that make up the uh, pay for performance tariff in the UK. And we looked at each one of those. And I could tell you that the three predictors, which when combined and are all delivered, are the key, key things that improve mortality and quality of life are joint orthogeriatric and surgical co-management, uh, identification of delirium postoperatively, and uh, a falls and future fracture prevention assessment by a specialist team. You get those three things right, you profoundly reduce mortality and you profoundly improve uh, morbidity and, uh, and improve quality of life. The, um, all the other things, time to surgery, uh, all the other stuff that's on the best practice tariff and we talk about in our, in our fragility fracture network meetings, seems to be completely irrelevant. Doesn't, doesn't move the needle at all. So if I had to summarize, the key thing that you can do for your patients, if you're a surgeon, is go and recruit an orthogeriatrician. One final question, um, Xavier, is that if you were to have uh, a femoral neck fracture, assuming uh, uh, that is at 60, obviously a long time to go to there, what would you have done? I thought you meant uh, me as a 21-year-old. If I had it, what would happen? I think, I think I'd think I Christoph fix it for me. Reductions just look wonderful. <laughs> no, go on. Answer your question, Vikas. Yeah, far away. So when I'm no, 60... No, no. Yeah, so what are you going to have done? You have a displaced femoral neck fracture at 60. Oh, that... And you're uh, at, hey, for a displaced femoral neck fracture, I'm having a total hip. Definitely. <laughs> By a hip surgeon in daylight hours. There we go. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Xavier. Uh, our last talk of the day is Professor Jim Waddell from Canada. Thanks, Jim.
Jim, at the moment we can't hear you and we can't see you either. All right, can you see me now? Brilliant, and we can hear you as well. Thanks, Jim. Thanks very much, Fikas. Uh, I have no disclosures uh, with regard to this presentation. <clears throat> and my topic is uh, much more general than the three that you've heard, and that is, <clears throat> can we uh, improve the outcome for hip fracture patients in general? And this process requires a consensus for defining the episode of hip fracture care, not just the operation, but from the time the patient's admitted to hospital until they're discharged home. And having defined the content, we want to establish a method to measure or document the outcome. And what we've looked at is uh, the uh, things listed here, time to surgery, weight-bearing status, a length of stay and discharge disposition, um, readmission rates and mortality rates. Now this requires domain definitions which I'm not going to dwell on here but this is how we measure things in a uh, universal healthcare system. Uh, effectiveness, appropriateness, the integration of care, the efficacy and access. How is it, how easy is it for patients to obtain this? Now you have to remember that in general, hip fracture patient population, they're elderly, they're often solitary, living alone. They may have poor social support, and many of them are chronically ill. So stratifying the risk for satisfactory outcome has, all, has already been mentioned. So we've mostly talked today about healthy at-home patients, but we also have complex at home, our definition, which is active chronic illness, and of course, a significant number from institutions. And so all aspects of care for these patients have to be addressed if you're going to set up a system that will provide comprehensive care for them. I'm gonna show you an algorithm that's universal. You can use it in any hospital, but the implementation is site specific and you'll see what I mean as we go along. Now this was data from 2008 in the province of Ontario. It's hard for you to read these numbers, but it was these numbers which showed that only a third of patients sustaining a hip fracture in Ontario were able to return to their pre-injury uh, level of uh, living in terms of their home. And the other two There's your eye or palm We have a universal health care system in our province. And the cost was also uh, extravagant for the care of these patients. And so they asked us to set up a program that would improve the outcome for these patients. And so when we look at the data uh, from uh, eight years later, we see that now the mortality rate has decreased, but more importantly, almost two-thirds of patients who sustain a hip fracture are able to return to their um, previous living arrangements. So we've done this by improving every aspect of care for these patients. And this is uh, measured on uh, 12,000 uh, hip fracture patients that uh, we've looked after. And these quality standards are based on the work of the Health Quality Ontario Hip Fracture Committee, which I chaired. So here's the first quality statement. Uh, hip fracture patients are diagnosed within an hour of arriving in hospital. Their surgery is planned and they're admitted to an inpatient bed. We've selected 48 hours rather than 36 hours to uh, look at the practicality of providing care in our province. But this is the uh, hallmark for us, 48 hours to surgery. We think that uh, pain management is crucial in these patients. Uh, the last speaker mentioned uh, the issue of delirium and uh, opioids are a potent cause of delirium in these uh, patients and therefore non-opiate uh, analgesics and particularly peripheral nerve blocks such as a uh, fasciolyaca block are used routinely in the management of these patients. 
Stable intertrochal carrot fractures should be treated surgically with a sliding hip screw. There's two reasons for this. Intermedullary nails are more expensive. And secondly, the blood loss with the nailing is higher than with sliding hip screws. Uh, Subtrochanteric and uh, unstable intertrochanteric fracture should be treated, of course, with an intermedullary nail. We've recommended that intercapsular fractures in the geriatric population, displaced intercapsular fractures in the geriatric population, should be treated with arthroplasty. And for the reasons just outlined, we have not made a recommendation for total hip replacement versus hemiarthroplasty, but leave that to the surgeon's discretion. We feel that uh, patients with hip fractures uh, should not receive blood transfusions if they're asymptomatic and have a postoperative hemoglobin level equal to or higher than 80. And so the rule of thumb is if your hemoglobin level is uh, lower than your age, you need a transfusion. Patients with hip fractures have to be mobilized to weight bearing as tolerated within 24 hours following surgery. There's excellent evidence to show that early weight bearing in this situation is beneficial for these patients. They have to get up every day. That includes uh, Saturday and Sunday. And delirium is extremely important in uh, the outcome for hip fracture care. And uh, we use a validated tool as part of their initial assessment when they're in the emergency department, and then every 12 hours while in hospital, and after transitions between settings, if they have to be moved for any reason, and they, receive, uh, they try to use uh, interventions to prevent delirium and to promote recovery if delirium occurs. If uh, they need an interdisciplinary team, as mentioned, in accordance with principles of geriatric care. This is important in our country where uh, geriatrics is an unpopular specialty and we do not have enough geriatricians to look after these patients. But we do have a number of family physicians with particular interest or hospitalists with a particular interest in geriatric care and they assist in the uh, care of these patients. Family should be included uh, in all decisions and discussions with regard to the treatment of the patient. And having them involved appears to be particularly relevant in the prevention of delirium. And this has been a huge problem for us during the um, COVID-19 pandemic in that visitors to hospitals have been severely restricted. And we have noticed a significant uh, increase in post-operative delirium in our hip fracture patients. Uh, we think that everyone with a hip fracture should participate in a rehabilitation program, either as an inpatient or on an outpatient basis. Osteoporosis management. Uh, every patient admitted with a hip fracture is presumed to have osteoporosis, <clears throat> and <clears throat> they require an assessment from a clinician with osteoporosis experience while they're in hospital. And they should not be discharged from hospital without a prescription for the treatment of their osteoporosis. And finally, follow-up care in our uh, system has been very poor for these patients. Often they do not see the orthopedic surgeon who treated them again. And the orthopedic surgeon is therefore unaware of the often poor outcome for these individuals. So they should be seen by their primary care physician within uh, two weeks of returning home and by their treating orthopedic surgeon within 12 weeks of their surgery. Now here you can see some data where uh, we started off at 73% of patients uh, being operated on within uh, 24 hours or 48 hours, I'm sorry, getting up to 80% in 2015. And this has continued uh, uh, at around 80 to 85 percent since that time. Data collection uh, runs about 18 months behind um, in terms of reporting and with the uh, COVID problem in the last uh, 24 months we've had difficulty obtaining uh, our data. There's still room for improvement however you see at the left hand side of this graph uh, some hospitals are able to achieve 95 percent 
And on the right-hand side of the graph, you see some hospitals are down around 65%. So uh, we know that there's sub substantial room for improvement in the laggard hospitals. The mortality rate has decreased slightly. Um, people say, well, that's not much, you know, 1.5%. Well, actually, you're talking about when you have thousands of patients, you're talking about hundreds of people that did not die um, as a result of their hip fracture. Um, this is a sobering slide. If you look at the left-hand side, you have a hospital where 22% of their hip fracture patients died. And on the right-hand slide, you have a hospital where 5% of their hip fracture patients died. So I don't have to ask you where you'd like to be treated or where you'd like your mother to be treated under these circumstances. And uh, so the hospitals on the left are being strongly encouraged to improve their uh, activity. The length of stay has decreased by four days, which is uh, a significant cost saving and also uh, encourages uh, people to be more aggressive in the management of their hip fracture population. The readmission rate has remained uh, relatively constant uh, despite the earlier discharge, suggesting that the patients are being discharged in an appropriate uh, uh, fashion. The refractory rate unfortunately remains relatively the same despite our push to manage the osteoporosis of these patients. We also have a uh, falls prevention program which is instituted while the patients are in hospital. Um, we have increased the percentage of patients being sent home with um, rehabilitation and we have increased the number of patients going to inpatient rehabilitation and have decreased the number of patients going to long-term care. So this has been a real plus for us in terms of getting people back to their uh, home environment. We've been very successful around reducing uh, blood uh, transfusions in these patients uh, with a significant decrease. Well, again, you'll see on the left-hand side, some hospitals continue to use uh, excessive amounts of uh, blood transfusion. And on the right, uh, more where we should be in terms of uh, our use of this product. <clears throat> Despite our best efforts, there has been an increase in the use of intramedullary nails for these uh, patients and a decrease in sliding hip screws uh, for intertrochanteric fractures. We're not sure that this is appropriate because this graph shows you that some hospitals <coughs> use, on the right-hand side, use only intramedullary nails and the hospitals on the left never or rarely ever use intramedullary nails. So our message to the uh, treating surgeon is, as I said, to differentiate between the groups of patients, and make a decision on the device with regard to the fracture type. Arthroplasty, you can see here, about 50, just over 50% of the patients are getting um, heavy arthroplasties and around 20% uh, total hip replacements, the remainder having um, sliding hip screws or uh, cannulated screws. So the outcome of this scorecard, we have had uh, an increase in weight bearing after surgery. There's been a significant decrease in the length of stay for these patients and a decrease in the time to surgery, an increase in discharge home, a decrease in admissions to long-term care, a decrease in admissions to slow stream rehab and a significant decrease in readmission rates. So in summary, I think the implementation in hospitals, you should realize, is facilitated by either pre-printed order sets or in hospitals with full electronic medical record, having the, uh, the order set for hip fractures uh, uh, preloaded uh, in the electronic medical record so that everything is done uh, automatically and it doesn't require it being uh, individually entered. Uh, compliance at the hospital level is assessed by a medical record audit, these performance indicators, and this is carried out on a routine basis. 
The program has had early success with lower mortality and early discharge rates and increased numbers of patients returning to their primary residence. The scorecard is still in use and it documents outcomes for around 11,000 hip fracture patients per year and the outcomes for these patients have improved as a result since the outcomes are publicly available on the uh, provincial website. Thank you for your attention. I would like to congratulate you, Jim, to this talk, just on a personal basis, because uh, what you are showing is exactly what we have seen. Uh, we were able to publish it last year. After implementation of a service like you are taking care of, all of a sudden you get more patients, and you get sicker patients, and uh, we compared the time before and after implementation. Um, and interestingly, what we found is that uh, even the sicker patients that you get, they have uh, a similar outcome than the previously not so sick patients. And so it, I think it's a, it has been proven in multiple ways that uh, uh, the, the co-management is, is a perfect solution. Just a quick... Uh... Yeah, I think it's, a, it's an interesting phenomenon because I think many of us, the older, older surgeons here, um, sort of were trained to think, well, the hip fracture is uh, an end-of-life event and um, you do an operation to try and uh, manage their pain or discomfort without any thought of uh, trying to restore function. And over the last 20 years, it's been become increasingly evident that uh, with the right kind of care, including um, the, right, the right operation, but more importantly, I think, the better perioperative care, um, Many of these people can go home and uh, continue a very productive, uh, very productive life. Uh, Jim, you know, it's the most common. The most common fracture we operate on is the most expensive fracture patient we looked after outside of polydrama, and um, the the numbers are increasing despite our best efforts. As the population ages, even though the percentage per population of fractures goes down with manage, better management of osteoporosis, the sheer volume of the aging population increases the number of hip fractures. And places like the UK have recognized this and have had a very aggressive program to manage these patients. And uh, the rest of Europe as well, Northern Europe in particular. And so I think we're becoming more accustomed to managing these people uh, in an aggressive and appropriate way. Jim, excellent talk. One quick question coming from the audience, and that's uh, the question on anticoagulation. If these patients uh, are on anticoagulants, um, what's what's your preference in Canada? Do you uh, do you give them a reversal <laughs> agent to speak to surgery, or uh, how do you manage those? Well, I think uh, this goes back to uh, what Xavier was talking about, the, uh, the reason for delay. The patient on anticoagulation almost always has an underlying health problem. And um, so there, there, there's a number of different strategies that are used. Many of the patients are on apixaban, which is a platelet, antiplatelet inhibitor, and um, we, we wait for those patients. Uh, but the others, we reverse the anticoagulation and uh, go ahead. There's pretty good evidence to suggest that uh, even in the face of an anticoagulation, uh, properly done operation um, does not pose a significant risk to these patients. The problem is spinal anesthesia. You can, they all have to have a general anesthetic. But a recent study has shown there's no difference in outcome between spinal anesthesia and general anesthesia, either in um, morbidity, mortality, or delirium. So we're not reluctant to give patients a general anesthetic anymore. Chris, any further questions from you? I think this was a very uh, convincing talk and uh, yeah, we are. Looks like uh, throughout the world, uh, people are recognizing that this is uh, what is going on and what needs to be done. Thank you very much. So I think we are just coming up to our 90 minutes uh, on the webinar. 
I'd like to thank the speakers on behalf of both AO and SICO for had the fantastic four excellent talks. And if you missed it by any chance, then it will be available both on the AO and the SICO portal uh, on demand for you to view. A big thank you to both SICOT and AO for allowing us to host this collaborative series, which has been excellent. We've had over 1,000 registrations from all around the world and over 300 of you attending as well uh, this webinar. Uh, finally, uh, the next webinar on the SICOT Pioneer Series is on Friday with uh, Mo Bandari and AJ Malvia uh, kicking off their research series. That's the third in the series. Uh, and a big thank you to all the viewers as well who've taken the time out to attend this in the middle of the day or the evening or early morning. So from all of us here, <laughs> myself, a big thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you.